All right, I hope you enjoyed chapter one of A Wrinkle in Time. Now it's time for chapter two. Chapter two, A Rip in the Galaxy. When Meg and Charles Wallace returned to the house silently, each holding strange and new thoughts, evening was moving in with the wind. The twins were waiting for them and wanted Charles Wallace to go out in the last of the light to play catch. It's too dark already, Charles Wallace said. We've got a few minutes. Come on, Charles, you may be bright, but you're slow at playing ball. I could pitch when I was six and you can't even catch without fumbling. Denny's patted Charles a pat more like a whack. He's improving. Come on, we've only got a few minutes. Charles Wallace shook his head. He did not mention that he did not feel well. He just said firmly, not tonight. Meg left the twins still arguing with him and went into the kitchen. Mrs. Murray was just coming in from the laboratory and her mind was still on her work. She peered vaguely into the refrigerator. May confronted her. Mother, Charles Wallace thinks something is wrong with his mitochondria or ferrandoli or something. Mrs. Murray shut the refrigerator door. Sometimes Charles Wallace thinks too much. What does Dr. Kalubra think about this mitochondria bit? That it's a possibility. Louise thinks the bad flu strain this autumn, which has caused a lot of deaths, may not be flu at all, but mitochondritis. And that's what Charles Wallace maybe has? I don't know, Meg, I'm trying to find out. When I know something, I will tell you, I've already said that. Meanwhile, let, him, let me alone. Meg took a step backwards, sat down on one of the dining chairs. Her mother never talked in that cold, shutting out way to her children. It must mean that she was very worried indeed. Mrs. Murray turned toward Meg with an apologetic smile. Sorry, Megatron, I didn't mean to be sharp. I'm in the difficult position of knowing more about the possible ailments of mitochondria than almost anybody else today. I didn't expect to be confronted with the results of my work quite so soon. And I still don't know enough to tell you or Luis anything definite. Meanwhile, there's no point in our getting all worried unless we know there's a real reason. Right now, we'd better concentrate on Charles Wallace's problems at school. Is he well enough to go to school? I think so for now. I don't want to take him out until I have to. Come here, Obi, come here. Why not? He'd just have to go back eventually, Meg, and then things would be harder than ever if he, can, if he can just get through these first weeks. Mother, nobody around here has ever known a six-year-old boy like Charles. He's extremely intelligent, but there was a day when it wasn't unusual for a 12 or 13-year-old to graduate from Harvard or Oxford or Cambridge. It's unusual today, and you and father can hardly send him to Harvard at six. Anyhow, it isn't just that he, Obi, Obi, Oh, Obi, hold on. Sorry. Obi, stop. Come here. Come here. Come here. I don't want him to jump down. There you go. Sorry for the interruption. It's unusual today, and you and father can hardly send him to Harvard at six. Anyhow, it isn't just that he's intelligent. How does he know? How does he know what we're thinking and feeling? I don't know how much you've told him, but he knows an awful lot about mitochondria and ferrandoli. I've told him a reasonable amount. He knows more than a reasonable amount, and he knows you're worried about him. Mrs. Murray perched on one of the high stools by the kitchen counter with, with which divided the work area from the rest of the bright rambling dining and studying room. She sighed. You're right, Meg. Charles Wallace not only has a good mind, he has extraordinary powers of intuition. If he can learn to discipline and channel them when he grows up, if he, she broke off. I have to think about getting dinner. Meg knew when to stop pushing her mother. I'll help, what are we having? She did not mention Charles Wallace's dragons. She did not mention Louise, the larger strange behavior, nor the shadow of whatever it was they had not quite seen. Oh, spaghetti's easy. Mrs. Murray pushed a curl of dark red hair back from her forehead and good on an autumn night. 
and we've got all the tomatoes and peppers and stuff from the twins garden mother i love the twins even when they get in my hair but charles i know meg you and charles have always had a very special relationship mother i can't stand what's happening to him at school neither can i meg then what are you doing about it we're trying to do nothing it would be easy for now to take charles wallace out of school we thought about that immediately even before he but Charles Wallace is going to have to live in a world made up of people who don't think at all in any of the ways in any of the ways that he does. And the sooner he starts learning to get along with them, the better. Neither you nor Charles has the ability to adapt the, that the twins do. Charles is a lot brighter than the twins. A life form which can't adapt doesn't last very long. I still don't like it. Neither do your father and I, Meg. Bear with us. Remember, you do have a tendency to rush in when the best thing to do is wait and be patient for a while. I'm not in the least patient. Is that for my information? Mrs. Murray took tomatoes, onions, green and red peppers, garlic and leeks out of the vegetable bin. Then starting to slice onions in a large black iron pot, she said thoughtfully, you know, Meg, you went through a pretty rough time at school yourself. Not as bad as Charles, and I'm not as bright as Charles, except maybe in math. Possibly you're not, though you do tend to underestimate your own particular capacities. What I'm getting at is that you do seem this year to be finding school moderately bearable. Mr. Jenkins isn't there anymore, and Calvin O'Keefe is. Calvin's important. He's the basketball star and president of the senior class and everything. Anybody Calvin likes is sort of protected by his, his aura. Why do you suppose Calvin likes you? Not because of my beauty, that's for sure. He does like you, doesn't he, Meg? Well, yes, I guess so, but Calvin likes lots of people and he could have any girl in school if he wanted to. But he chose you, didn't he? Meg could feel herself flushing. She put her hands up to her cheeks. Well, yes, but it's different. It's because of some of the things we've been through together. And we're friend friends. I mean, we're not like most of the other kids. I'm glad you're friend friends. I've become very fond of that skinny, carrot-headed young man. Meg laughed. I think Calvin confuses you with Pallas Athene. You're his absolute ideal, and he likes all of us. His own family is certainly a mess. I really think he's like me. He only likes me because of our family. Mrs. Murray sighed. Stop being self-deprecating, Meg. Maybe at least I can learn to cook as well as you do. Did you know it was one of Calvin's brothers who beat up Charles Wallace today? I bet he's upset. I don't mean whippy, he couldn't care less. Calvin, somebody's bound to have told him. Do you want to call him? Not me, not Calvin. I just have to wait. Maybe he'll come over or something. She sighed. I wish life didn't have to be so complicated. Do you suppose I'll ever be a double PhD like you, mother? Mrs. Murray looked up from slicing peppers and laughed. It's really not the answer to all problems. There are other solutions. At this point, I'm more interested in knowing whether or not I've put too many red peppers in the spaghetti sauce. I've lost count. They had just sat down to dinner when Mr. Murray phoned to tell them that he was going directly from Washington to Brookhaven for a week. Such trips were not unusual for either of their parents, but right now, anything that took either her father or mother away struck Meg as sinister. Without much conviction, she said, I hope he has fun. He likes lots of the people there, but she felt a panicky dependence on having both her parents home at night. It wasn't only because of her fears for Charles Wallace, it was that suddenly the whole world was unsafe and uncertain. Several houses nearby had been broken into that autumn, and while nothing of great value had been taken, drawers had been emptied with casual maliciousness, food dumped on living room floors, a poultry, upholstery slashed, even their safe little village was revealing itself to be unpredictable and irrational and precarious. And while Meg had already begun to understand this with her mind, she had never before felt it with the whole of herself. Now a cold awareness of the uncertainty of all life, no matter how careful the planning, hollowed emptily in the pit of her stomach. She swallowed. Charles Wallace looked at her and said unsmilingly, the best laid plans of mice and men Gang aft agely, Sandy finished. Man proposes, God disposes, Denny's added not to be outdone. The twins held off their plates for more spaghetti, neither one having been known to lose their appetite. 
Why does father have to stay a whole week? Sandy asked. It's his work after all, Denny said. Mother, I think you could have put more hot peppers in the sauce. He's been away a lot this summer. He had to stay home with his family at least some of the time. I think the sauce is okay. Of course it's okay. I just like it a little hotter. Meg was not thinking about spaghetti, although she was sprinkling Parmesan over hers. She wondered what their mother would say if Charles Wallace told her about his dragons. If there really were dragons or a reasonable facsimile thereof in the North Pasture, oughtn't their parents to know? Sandy said, when I grow up, I'm going to be a banker and make money. Someone in this family has to stay in the real world. Not that we don't think science is the real world, mother, Denny said, but you and father aren't practical scientists, you're theoretical scientists. Mrs. Murray demurred, I'm not wholly impractical, you know, Sandy, and neither is your father. Spending hours and hours peering into your micro electron microscope and listening to that micro sonar, what's it, is it practical, Sandy announced. You just look at things nobody else can see, Denny's added, and listen to things nobody else can hear and think about them. Meg defended her mother. It would be a good idea if more people knew how to think. After mother thinks about something long enough, then she puts it into practice or someone else does. Charles Wallace cocked his head with a pleased look. Does practical mean that something works out in practice? His mother nodded. So it doesn't matter if mother sits and thinks or if father spends weeks over one equation, even if he writes it on the tablecloth. His equations are practical if someone else makes them work out in practice. He reached in his pocket as though an answer to make thoughts about the dragons and drew out a feather, not a bird feather, but a strange glitter catching the light. All right, my practical brothers, what is this? Sandy sitting next to Charles Wallace bent over the dragon feather. A feather? Denny's got up and went around the table so they could see, let me. Charles Wallace held the feather between them. What kind is it? Hey. This is most peculiar, Sandy touched the base of the feather. I don't think it's from a bird. Why not, Charles Wallace asked. The rachis isn't right. The what, Meg asked. The rachis, sort, sort of part of the quill. The rachis should be hollow, and this is solid and seems to be metallic. Hey, Charles, where'd you get this thing? Charles Wallace handed the feather to his mother. She looked at it carefully. Sandy's right, the rachis isn't like a bird's. Denny said, then what? Charles Wallace retrieved the feather and put it back in his pocket. It was on the ground by the big rocks in the north pasture, not just this one feather, quite a few others. Meg suppressed a slightly hysterical giggle. Charles and I think it may be fumits. Sandy turned to her with injured dignity. Fumits are dragon droppings. Denny said, don't be silly. Then do you know what it is, mother? She shook her head. What do you think it is, Charles? Charles Wallace, as he occasionally did, retreated into himself. When Meg decided he wasn't going to answer at all, he said, it's something that's not in Sandy and Denny's practical world. When I found out more, I'll tell you. He sounded very much like their mother. Okay, then. Denny had lost interest. He returned to his chair. Did father tell you why he has to go rushing off to Brookhaven, or is it another of those top secret classified things? Mrs. Murray looked down at the check table cloth and at the remains of an equation which had not come out in the wash. Doodling equations on anything available was a habit of which she could not break her husband. It's not really secret. There have been several bits about it in the papers recently. About what, Sandy asked. There's been an unexplainable phenomenon, not in our part of the galaxy, but far across it and in several other galaxies. Well, the easiest way to explain it is that our new supersensitive sonic instruments have been picking up strange sounds, sound, sounds which aren't on any normal register, but much higher. After such a sound, a cosmic scream, the Times rather sensationally called it, there appears to be a small rip in the galaxy. What does that mean, Dunnies asked? It seems to mean that several stars have vanished. Vanished where? That's the odd part vanished completely. Where the stars there were there is, as far as our instruments can detect, nothing. Your father was out in California several weeks ago, you remember at Mount Palomar? But things can't just vanish, Sandy said. We had it in school, the balance of matter. The mother added very quietly, it seems to be getting unbalanced.
You mean like the ecology? No, I mean that matter actually seems to be being annihilated. Denny said flatly, but that's impossible. E equals MC squared, Sandy said. Matter can be converted into energy and energy into matter. You have to have one or the other. Mrs. Murray said thus far, Einstein's law has never been disproved, but it's coming into question. Nothingness, Danny said, that's impossible. One would hope so. And that's what father's going off about? Yes, to consult with several other scientists, Shasti from India, Shen Shu from China, you've heard of them. Outside the dining room windows came a sudden brilliant flash of light, followed by a loud clap of thunder. The windows rattled, the kitchen door burst open, everybody jumped. Meg sprang up crying nervously, oh mother! Sit down, Meg, you've heard thunder before. You're sure it's not one of those cosmic things? Sandy shut the door. Mrs. Murray was calmly reassuring, positive. They're completely inaudible to human ears. Lightning flashed again, thunder boomed. As a matter of fact, there are only two instruments in the world delicate enough to pick up the sound, which is incredibly high pitched. Hold on. Walks down and then he's down and he's getting into things he should not. Because he's naughty, naughty. All right. Positive, they're completely inaudible to human ears. Lightning flashed again, thunder boomed. As a matter of fact, there are only two instruments in the world delicate enough to pick up the sound, which is incredibly high pitched. It's perfectly possible that it's been going on for billion, millennia, and only now are our instruments capable of recording it. Birds can hear sounds way above our normal pitch, Sandy said. I mean, way up the scale that we can't hear at all. Birds can't hear this. Denny said, I wonder if snakes can hear as high as pitch as birds. Snakes don't have ears, Sandy contradicted. So they feel vibrations and sound waves. I think Louise hears all kinds of things out of human range. What's for dessert? Meg's voice was still tense. We don't usually have thunderstorms in October. Please calm down, Meg. Mrs. Murray started clearing the table. If you'll stop and think, you'll remember that we've had an unseasonable storm for every month in the year. Sandy said, why does Meg always exaggerate everything? Why does she have to be so cosmic? What's for dessert? I don't, Meg started defensively, then jumped as the rain began to pelt against the windows. There's some ice cream in the freezer, Mrs. Murray said. Sorry, I haven't been thinking about desserts. Meg's supposed to make desserts, Denny said. Not that we expect pies or anything, Meg, but even you can't go too wrong with jello. Charles Wells caught Meg's eye and she closed her mouth. He put his hand in his pocket of the robe again, though this time he did not produce the feather and gave her a small private smile. He may have been thinking about his dragons, but he had also been listening carefully both to the conversation and to the storm. His fair head tilted slightly to one side. This ripping in the galaxy, mother, does it have any effect on our own solar system? That, Mrs. Murray replied, is what we would all like to know. Sandy brushed this aside impatiently. It's all too complicated for me. I'm sure banking is a lot simpler. And more lucrative, Denny's added. The windows shook in the wind. The twins looked through the darkness at the slashing rain. It's a good thing we brought in so much stuff from the garden before dinner. This is almost hail. Meg asked nervously, is it dangerous, this, this ripping in the sky or whatever it is? Meg, we really know nothing about it. It may have been going on all along and we only now have the instruments to record it. Like Farandoli, Charles Wallace said. We tend to think things are new because we've just discovered them. But is it dangerous, Meg repeated. Meg, we don't know enough about it yet. That's why it's important that your father and some of the other physicists get together at once. But it could be dangerous. Anything can be dangerous. Meg looked down at the remains of her dinner, dragons and rips in the sky, Louise and Fortinbras reading something large and strange, Charles Wallace pale and listless. She did not like any of it. I'll do the dishes, she told her mother. 
They cleaned up the kitchen in silence. Mrs. Murray had sent the reluctant twins to practice for the school orchestra. Denny's on the flute, which he played well, accompanied by Sandy less skillfully on the piano, but it was a pleasant, familiar noise and Meg relaxed into it. When the dishwasher was humming, the pots and pans polished and hung on their hooks, she went up to her attic bedroom to do her homework. This room was supposed to be her own private place and it would have been perfect except for the fact that it was seldom really private. The twins kept their electric trains in the big open section of the attic. The ping pong table was there and anything anybody didn't want around downstairs but didn't want to throw away. Although Meg's room was at the far end of the attic, it was easily available to the twins when they needed help with their math homework. And Charles Wallace always knew without being told when she was troubled. Anne would come up to the attic to sit on the foot of the bed. The only time she didn't want Charles Wallace was when he himself was what was troubling her. She did not want him now. Rain was still splattering against her window, but with diminishing force. The wind was swinging around from the south to the west. The storm was passing and the temperature falling. Her room was cold, but she did not plug in the little electric heater her parents had given her to supplement the inadequate heat which came up through the attic stairs. Instead, she shoved her books aside and tiptoed back downstairs, stepping carefully over the seventh stair, which not only creaked, but sometimes gave off a report like a shot. The twins were still practicing. Her mother was in the living room in front of the fire, reading to Charles Wallace, not from books about trains or animals, which the twins had liked at that age, but from a scientific magazine, an article called The Polarizabilities and Hyperpolarizabilities of Small Molecules by the theoretical chemist Peter Liebman. Ouch, Meg thought ruefully. This kind of thing is Charles Wallace's bedtime reading and our parents expect him to go to first grade and not get into trouble. Charles Wallace lay on the floor in front of the fire, staring into the flames, half listening, half brooding. His head as usual pillowed on Fort and Bross's comfortable bulk. Meg would have liked to take Fort with her, but that would mean letting the family know she was going out. She hurried as quickly and silently as possible through the kitchen and out into the pantry. As she pulled the kitchen door closed behind her, slowly, carefully, so nobody would hear, the pantry door flew open with a bang, and the door to her mother's lab on the left slammed shut in a gust of wind. She stopped, listened, waited for one of the twins to open the kitchen door and see what was going on, but nothing happened except that the wind blew wildly through the pantry. She shivered and grabbed the first rain clothes that came to hand, a big black rubber poncho that belonged to the twins and had done double duty as a ground cloth for a tent and Charles Wallace's yellow suester. Then she took the big flashlight from the hook, shut the pantry door in front of behind her and ran across the lawn, tripping over the croquet wicket. Limping, she crossed the patch of dandelion, burdock and milkweed that was growing up in the opening the twins had cut in the barberry fence. Once she was in the vegetable garden, she hoped that she would be invisible to anybody chancing to look out a window. She could imagine Sandy or Denny's reaction if they asked her where she was going and she told them that she was looking for dragons. Why, in fact, had she come out? And what was she looking for? Was it dragons? Fort and Bross and Louise both had seen and not been afraid of something, something which had left the feathers and scales. And that something or some things was likely to be uncomfortable in the wet pasture. If it or they came to seek shelter in the house, she wanted to be prepared. Not only for dragons in which she did not quite believe, despite her faith in Charles Wallace and the father with the peculiar rackets and the feather with a peculiar rachis, but also for Louise the larger. The twins insisted that Louise was an unusual snake, but this afternoon was the first time Meg had seen any signs that Louise was anything more than a contented common garden variety snake. Meg checked the shadows on the wall, but there was no sign of Louise, so she lingered, not at all anxious to cross the apple orchard and go into the north pasture to the two glacial rocks. For a few minutes, she would stay in the homely garden and gather her courage and be safe from discovery. The twins were hardly likely to come out after dark in the cold and wet to admire the last few cabbages or the vine which had borne their prized cucumber the size of a vegetable marrow. The garden was bordered on the east by two rows of sunflowers which stood with their heavy fringed heads bowed over so that they looked like a huddle of witches. May glanced at them nervously, raindrops dripped from their faces with melancholy unconcern but no longer from the sky. There was a hint of light from the full moon behind the thinning clouds turning all the vegetables into beans strange and unreal. The gaping rows where once beans had stood and lettuce and peas and had a forlorn look. There was an air of sadness and confusion about the carefully planned pattern. Like everything else, Meg spoke to the few remaining cauliflower heads, 
it's falling apart. It's not right in the United States of America that a little kid shouldn't be safe in school. She moved slowly along the orchard wall. The cidery smell of fallen apples was cut by the wind which had completely changed course and was now streaming across the garden from the northwest, sharp and glittery with frost. She saw, she saw a shadow move on the wall and jumped back. Louise the larger, it must be Louise, and May could not climb that wall across the orchard to the north pasture until she was sure that neither Louise nor that not quite seen shape was lurking there waiting to pounce on her. Her legs felt watery, so she sat on a large squat pumpkin to wait. The cold wind brushed her cheek. Corn tassels hissed like ocean waves. She looked warily about. She was seeing, she realized, through lenses streaked and splattered by raindrops blowing from sunflowers and corn. So she took off her spectacles, felt under the poncho for her kilt, and wiped them. Better though the world was still a little wavery as though seen underwater. She listened. Listened. In the orchard, she heard the soft plump of falling apples, wind shaking the trees, branches rustling. She peered through the darkness. Something was moving, coming closer. Snakes never come out in the cold and dark, she knew that. Nevertheless, Louise. Yes, it was the big snake. She emerged from the rocks of the stone wall slowly, warily, watchfully. Meg's heart was thumping, although Louise was not threatening. At least Louise was not threatening her. But Louise was waiting, and this time there was no welcome in the waiting. Meg looked in fascination as the head of the snake slowly leaped back and forth and quivered in recognition. Behind Meg, a voice came, Margaret. She whirled around. It was Mr. Jenkins. She looked at him in complete bewilderment. He said, your little brother thought I might find you here, Margaret. Yes, Charles would guess would know where she was, but why would Mr. Jenkins have been speaking to Charles Wallace? The principal had never been to the Murray's house or any parents for that matter. All confrontations were in the safe anon anonymity of his office. Why would he come through the wet grass and the still dripping garden to look for her instead of sending one of the twins? He said, I wanted to come to find you myself, Margaret, because I feel that I owe you an apology for my sharpness with you last week when you came to see me. He held out a hand, pale in the moonlight, wavering behind the clouds. In utter confusion, she reached out to take his hand, and as she did so, Louise rose up on the wall behind her, hissing, and making a strange warning clacking. Meg turned to see the snake, looking as large and hooded as a cobra, hissing angrily at Mr. Jenkins, raising her large dark coils to strike. Mr. Jenkins screamed in a way that she'd never known a man could scream, a high, piercing screech. Then he rose up into the night like a great flapping bird, flew screaming across the sky, became a rent, an emptiness, a slash of nothingness. Meg found that she too was screaming. It could not have happened. There was no one, no thing there. She thought she saw Louise slithering back through a dark recess and the stone wall disappearing. It was impossible. Her mind had snapped. It was some kind of hallucination caused by the weather, by her anxiety, by the state of the world. A thick, ugly smell like spoiled cabbage, like flower stalks left too long in water, rose like a miasma from the place where Mr. Jenkins had been. But he could not have been there. She screamed again in an uncontrollable panic as a tall shape hurtled towards her. Calvin, Calvin O'Keefe. She burst into hysterical tears of relief. He vaulted over the wall to her, his strong, thin arms tight around her, holding her. Meg, Meg, what is it? She could not control her terrified sobbing. Meg, what's the matter? What happened? He shook her urgently. Gasping, she tried to tell him. I know, it sounds incredible, she finished. She was still trembling violently, her heart racing, when she did not speak, but continued soothing. When he did not speak, but continued soothingly to pat her back, she said through a few final hiccuping sobs, Oh, Calvin, I wish I had imagined it. Do you think, do you think maybe I did? I don't know, Calvin said flatly. He continued to hold her strongly, comfortingly. Now that Calvin was here, would take over, she was able to manage a slightly hysterical giggle. <laughs> Mr. Jenkins always said I have too much imagination, but it's never been that kind of imagination. I've never hallucinated or anything, have I? No, he replied firmly, you have not. What's that awful stench? 
I don't know. It's not nearly as bad now as it was just before you came. Makes silage, silage smell like roses. Yuck. Calvin, Louise the Larger. It's not the first time today. Louise has done something peculiar. What? She told him about Louise that afternoon. But she wasn't attacking or anything. She was still friendly. She's always been a friendly snake. She let her breath out in a long, quavering sigh. Cal, let me have your handkerchief, please. My glasses are filthy and I can't see a thing. And right now I'd like to be able to see what's going on. A handkerchief is filthy, but Calvin fished in his pockets. It's better than a kilt. Meg spat on her glasses and wiped them. Without their aid, she, couldn't, she could see no more of the older boy than a vague blur. So she made bold to say, Oh, Cal, I was hoping you might come over tonight anyhow. I'm surprised you're even willing to speak to me. I came over to apologize for what my brother did to Charles Wallace. Meg adjusted her spectacles with her usual rough shove up the nose, just as a shaft of moonlight broke through the clouds and illuminated Calvin's troubled expression. She returned his handkerchief. It wasn't your fault. Then, I must have had a mental aberration or something about Louise and Mr. Jenkins, mustn't I? I don't know, Meg. You've never had a mental aberration before, have you? Not that I know of. Few minutes to Mr. Jenkins, anyhow. She almost shouted, what did you say? Fumits to Mr. Jenkins. Fumits is my new swear word. I'm tired of all the old ones. Fumits are dragon droppings, and I know what fumits are dragon droppings. What I want to know is why you picked on fumits of all things. Seemed quite a reasonable choice to me. Suddenly she was shaking again. Calvin, please don't. It's too serious. He dropped his bantering tone. Okay, Meg, what's up about fumits? Oh, Cal, I was so sort of shook about the Mr. Jenkins thing. I almost forgot about the dragons. The what? She told him all about Charles Wallace and his dragons, and he's never hallucinated before either. She told him again about Louise greeting the shadow of something they had not quite seen, but it certainly wasn't Mr. Jenkins. Louise wasn't at the least friendly about Mr. Jenkins. It's wild, Calvin said, absolutely wild. But we did see fumits, Calvin, or something more like feathers, really, but not like real feathers. Charles Wallace took one home. There was a whole pile of them, these sort of feathers and dragon scales by the biggest rock in the North Pasture. Calvin sprang to his feet. Let's go then, bring your flashlight. It was possible now for her to cross the orchard and go into the pasture with Calvin to take the lead. Uppermost in Meg's mind, sur superseding fear was the need to prove that she and Charles Wallace weren't just making something up that the wild tales she had told Calvin were real, not Mr. Jenkins turning into a flying emptiness in the sky. She did not want that to be real, but the dragons. For if nothing that had happened touched on reality, then she was going out of her mind. When they reached the pasture, Calvin took the light from her. I'll go ahead a bit. But Meg followed close on his heels. She thought she could sense disbelief as he swept the arc of light around the base of the rock. The beam came to rest in a small circle, and in the center of the circle shone something gold and glittering. Phew, Calvin said. May giggled with relief and tension. Don't you mean fumets? Has anybody ever seen a fumet? Calvin was down on hands and knees, running his fingers through the little pile of feathers and scales. Okay, okay, this is most peculiar, but what left it? After all, a gang of dragons just doesn't disappear. A drive of dragons may correct it automatically. Do you really think it's dragons? Calvin did not answer. He asked, did you tell your mother? Charles Wallace showed the feather to the twins during dinner and mother saw it too. The twins said it wasn't a bird's feather because the rachis isn't right. And then the conversation got shifted. I think Charles shifted it on purpose. How is he, Calvin asked. How badly did Whippy hurt him? He's been hurt worse. Mother put compresses on his eye and it's turning black and blue, but that's about all. She was not ready yet to mention his pallor or shortness of wind. You'd think we lived in the roughest section of an inner city or something instead of way out in this peaceful country. There isn't a day he doesn't get shoved around by one of the bigger kids. It's not only whippy cow. Why is it that my parents know all about physics and biology and stuff and nothing about keeping their son from being mugged? Calvin pulled himself up onto the smaller of the two stones. It's any consolation to you, Meg. I doubt if my parents know the difference between physics and biology. Maybe Charles would be better off in a city school where there's lots of different kinds of kids. White, black, yellow, Spanish-speaking, rich, poor. 
Maybe he wouldn't stand out as being so different if there were other different people too. Here, well, everybody's sort of alike. People are kind of proud of having your parents live here and pally with the president and all, but you Murray certainly aren't like anybody else. You've managed, same way the twins have, playing by the laws of the jungle. You know that. Anyhow, my, grand, my parents and grandparents were born right here in the village, and so were my great-grandparents. The O'Keefe's may be shiftless, but at least they're not newcomers. His voice deepened with an old sadness. Oh, Cal. He shrugged his dark mood aside. I think maybe we'd better go talk to your mother. Not yet, Charles Wallace's voice came from behind them. She's got enough worries. Let's wait till the dragons come back. Meg chumped. Charles, why aren't you in bed? Does mother know you're out? I was in bed. Mother doesn't know I'm out, obviously. Meg was near tears of exhaustion. Nothing is obvious anymore. Then in her big sister tone of voice, you shouldn't be out this late. What happened? What do you mean? Meg, I came out because something frightened you. He sighed, a strangely tired and ancient sigh from so small a boy. I was almost asleep and I felt you screaming. I don't want to talk about it. I don't want it to have happened. Where's Fortinbras? I left him at home and told him not to let on that I wasn't sound asleep in bed. I didn't want him tangling with dragons. Meg, what happened? You've got to tell me. Meg said, okay, Charles, I don't doubt your dragons anymore. No dragons could be more incredible than Mr. Jenkins coming to look for me in the garden and then turning into a, a great shrieking bird of nothingness. She spoke quickly because what she was saying sounded so absurd. Charles Wallace did not laugh. He opened his mouth to speak, then swung around. Who's there? Nobody, Calvin said. Meg and me. You? But he jumped down from the rock. There's somebody else. Near. Meg moved closer to Calvin. Her heart, it seemed, stopped beating. Hush, Charles Wallace said, though they had not spoken. He listened with lifted head like Morton Boras, catching a scent. To the right of the pasture was a woods. A small forest of oak, maple, beech, stripped of all but a few brittle leaves, backed by the dark winter richness of assorted spruce and pine. The ground, which the moonlit did not, moonlight did not reach, was covered with fallen damp leaves and pine needles, which would silence footsteps. Then they heard the sharp crack of a breaking twig. Meg and Calvin, straining to peer through the tree, saw nothing. Then Charles Wallace cried, my dragons! They turned around and they saw that, and there they saw there by the great rock, Wings. It seemed like hundreds of wings, spreading, folding, stretching, and eyes. How many eyes can a drive of dragons have? And small jets of flame. Suddenly a voice called to them from the direction of the woods. Do not be afraid. And we will stop there. Um, be sure you can check tomorrow. I'll go ahead and record an extra chapter for Friday. Um, so chapter three will be out on Friday for you to listen to. I'll see you later.